welcome to Out of the Box Radio with me, your host, Christine Blasdale. Out of the Box Radio is a weekly podcast of audible ear candy dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective on this thing that we call life. And each and every week, we're going to be diving into the topics that matter most with lively conversations on issues such as health, wellness, and transformational healing, all with the goal of creating a better world and becoming a happier human being. I will be your tour guide for this epic adventure, and each and every week we're going to be embarking on a journey with the ultimate goal being transformation to our highest potential. And now, let's get out of the box. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Out of the Box Radio. I'm your host, Christine Blasdale, and I'm really happy that you tuned in today because we're going to be, we're going to be actually getting some work done today. We're going to be doing some work. Uh, And the first question I want to ask you is, are you in the driver's seat of your life? Think about that really hard. Are you in the driver's seat of your life? Most people really aren't. And we're on autopilot. Our emotional reactions, such as stress, worry, frustration, anger, doubt, and fear are actually running the show most of the time. My guest today is uh, Inner Mastery Master himself, Mark Youngblood, and he's also the author of a brand new book that we're going to be talking about in this hour called Dear Human, Master Your Emotions. And Mark Youngblood, Mark, I'm talking to you today from, from Florida, correct? I am in Sarasota, Florida. That's right. And let's talk about the um your well i love to find out with my guests first of all how they get to the point where they are today inner mastery and you this is something that you've really actually been working on for many years and you're also a uh, a life coach and an executive coach can you tell our listeners how you got to this point today um teaching others about inner mastery uh, my pleasure christine you're starting off with a with a real tough question <laughs> i like to do that <laughs> Let's get us off on the right foot here. Well, it's kind of my my life journey has led me where I am today. Uh, I I write this in the book too that I, I grew up with a, a lot of things great in my childhood, but also some abuse, uh, specifically around the way that uh, my dad would punish us. And he was an alcoholic, and and he would fly into a rage, and he would beat us, and when he was angry at us. And it um, was a very s- scary way to grow up. And it left emotional, emotional scars. A lot of people, though, have experiences like that. And uh, I recently did a uh, webinar where I asked the audience the question, how many of you had what you would consider abuse in your childhood that still, you know, that affected you as an adult? And 80% of them said they did. Wow. So this is this is really very common, and there's all different kinds of abuse. But for me, it, it turned into behaviors as an adult that were wrecking my life. Uh, the The dysfunctional way I had of being in relationship led to a, my first divorce. It, I had struggles in business because I was seeing my father and all the authoritarian leaders that I was being exposed to. And and so I fig, uh, f- figured out I've got to get my act together. And uh, I had a real crisis where I'd started a company r- and it failed right at the same time my company failed. And and I kind of hit bottom. I know you've you've talked to, with a lot of people about hitting bottom is one of the times where you can remake your life. And I did. And I started on a personal journey of spiritual development, self-development. And, and that led to lots and lots and lots of developmental training, becoming a master practitioner and trainer of neuro-linguistic programming, going through extensive healing and self-development through that. And I've been in consulting most of my career, but I went into coaching at about the year 2000, and I'm using the tools I learned for myself plus other tools I learned along the way of, that are coaching technologies for helping people transform their lives. And through this process, Christine, what I've learned 
is we create our world from the inside out. Everybody is already creating their world from the inside out. They may not know that, but they are. Everything begins with our thoughts. And our thoughts lead to emotions. And those emotions and thoughts lead to behaviors. And the behaviors create the reactions the world has to us, which then leads to our next thought and set of reactions. So we're creating the world from the inside out, but most of us don't have any tools for how to do that, how to do that consciously and intentionally. And that's what I've been developing, and I call it inner mastery. It's not inner control. You know, control is a very different approach. It's about clamping down on things. Mastery is artfulness, skillfulness. It's about relationship with what's happening inside of us that enables us to make changes that lead to the changes we want in our outer world. And it's a it's a 180 degree shift from the way most people approach trying to be happy. How do most people approach being happy? Well, I already know the answer. I know. What do you? Well, I think I, I mean, this is what I see. Okay. This is what I yes. see around me right. is that I see a lot of very hurt people mm-hmm. um, reaching, uh, seeking their happiness outside of themselves seeking their happiness either through another human being, um, 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 status symbols perhaps, reaching a particular uh, level in, in their career or material things around them, seeking happiness, you know, in, and, and I don't think it's so much that they seek happiness in, in alcohol or drugs, but it's a way to escape their own inner, perhaps their own inner, inner turmoil. But it's, what I've seen, and it has not been working, obviously, because there's, look at the divorce rate, look at people being yes. addicted, is that this seeking of happiness outside of oneself um, is is not fulfilling. And so there's this perpetual forever and ever and ever seeking outside of the self, this happiness, this joy, this uh, uh, this level, this attainment. And what I'm getting from you and from and from so many of the guests that we've had on Out of the Box Radio is that it's an insight. Happiness is an inside job, as they say. Yes, yeah. uh, you're spot on. Every bit of what you said is is exactly right. And it comes down to this. If we're expecting the world out there to conform to our expectations so that we'll be happy, then we're going to be unhappy most of the time. Because the world isn't there to please us. (laughs) Other people, there isn't anything out there that is going, oh, I guess my job is to make Mark Youngblood happy today. (laughs) (laughs) And and so people, people are independent. They do what they do for their reasons and not for yours. Um, The events in life, we had a hurricane come through here and had to evacuate and we didn't have power for uh, uh, over almost two weeks and you know, lost trees, lost a fence. I didn't want any of that to happen. And yet it did. And, and, you know, that's mild compared to what so many people have suffered, uh, in from, you know, natural disasters in the last month and, and whether, whether the things that aren't going our way are the way our husband or wife or lover said something to us, did or didn't do something, whether our kids are not doing what we want them to do, whether we have a repair that we can't afford and didn't expect to have to make, whether the traffic's bad, whether my boss is being a jerk, whether I'm worried about my job, whatever is out there in the world that is a reason to be upset. It's just information and we have a choice. We have a choice about who we're going to be in the face of all those things. We don't very often have a choice about whether we're going to be around those things or whether those things are going to happen because most of them we can't change. So the only question is, who are we going to be in the face of all of those things that are happening? And in, and to be able to make that choice requires what we've been talking about and labeling as inner mastery, which I believe is the the fundamental life skill for a great life. Because when you change what's happening inside of you, you can be happy 
and I have a word I prefer to happiness, and that's fulfillment. You can be deeply fulfilled every single day. And and what's different to me is happiness tends to be a conditional thing. I'm happy or I'm unhappy. And fulfillment is about richness. Fulfillment is about this was a delicious day. <laughs> and it can be a delicious day no matter what's happening if you if you are choosing inside yourself the, the response you're going to have to that. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Um, Mark, too, I, I want to go back to when I, uh, when I first introduced you and you were talking about how through your life um, and because of the, uh, the fact that with, when you were a child, what you had uh, got, experienced as a child with a, a father, my father was also very much the same. Um, uh, and I don't know if it's the generation or, or what, um, and I don't know if it was also because um, I think that men of that generation, maybe hopefully today it's changing, but I don't know. Um, when when men were at that time too experiencing heartache, loss, tragedy, um, there was very little discussion about seeking help or or expressing the emotions. So my father too was also um, the same thing. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, I've, every child is sensitive. Okay, it's not a matter of one person being more sensitive than than another. But as a right. child, I was extremely sensitive, and I could feel emotion um, on a very uh, tight, very very close knit level. So mm -hmm. experiencing the rage and the same thing where it would be a violent, you know, a, a, an angry, explosive outburst. What was very interesting was that I remember as a child in my head saying this to him. Of course, I would never say it out loud because, you know, there's no way. But in my head, I would say, my goodness, that's an overreaction to the point to the point where I would say in my head to him, you need to master your emotion. You need to master how you how you handle things. As a child, I was saying that, you know, again, in my head, because if I said that out loud, I, you know, I wouldn't be here. But um, <laughs> but but um, and, and and I've noticed, too, with others that when as children, we experience these things, there's one of two ways we can go. Or maybe there's a gray area in between. But some grow up and they perpetuate that behavior on others, on, on, on coworkers or their children or their spouse, um, that, because that's how they saw that how emotions were handled, how uh, if, if something didn't go right, instead of saying, well, okay, I didn't get my way, let me figure out to do something else, Instead, it was an explosive reaction. So then they perpetuate that. And then there's those of us who, once we experience that, something inside of us says, I will never, I know what that feels like, and I will never yeah. uh, do that to another person. Have you noticed in your, in your working with people, um, the two, the, 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 the people going between those two extremes, or not extremes, but those two different uh, uh, ways of looking at it? Absolutely. Just <laughs> such a, a brilliant observation, Christine. Thank you for all of that. And I, I'm going to comment on your specific question, but I also want to circle back to something you said that is so crucial. I didn't have the awareness you had, which is pretty amazing for a child. You know, when my father was doing that, I just knew that it hurt. And, and, and at, when he would whip me, it would leave welts that lasted days, raised welts that would last days. And then when it was done, he'd make me hug him. Oh, no. And all I remember was going to my room, which was the next thing that had to happen is to go to my room and think about what I did. Of course. And, and yes, I, you, I just, you had to think about what you did. Yes. Yeah. And I literally hated him. I mean, I hated his guts. I, I remember being so angry. I broke a metal toy in my hands uh, as a little boy. Um, and, and it took becoming an adult and learning compassion and understanding that he didn't have any emotional skills at all. He was raised in an East Texas farm where what he was doing to me was a, a picnic in the park compared to the way he was um, punished and um, disciplined. And it's all he knew. And 
and he couldn't contain himself, and he also didn't know any other way to raise a child. And, and my response was, to, I'll never hit my child, and I didn't. And he was raised to be extremely disciplined. So yes, you know, people do one of two things. They, they either subconsciously become their parent, or they vow, I'll never be that, and they become the opposite. But no matter which way you go, our parents are in our shadow, our psychological shadow. They're inside of us. And the only peace we can ever have is to find those aspects of ourselves and learn to love them. And, and when we can do that, then we can love anybody. There's one other aspect to what you said is it's not just that we either become and repeat what our parents did because bullies create bullies or do the opposite. We also attract people that duplicate our parents. I know know you've heard these stories before, Christine, especially in our love relationships. We tend to find the dad or the mom that, that repeats what we got in our childhood. And, and I believe that happens, well, it happens subconsciously. We have, we, we, we want, those people show up in our lives to show us what we have to heal. And, and I believe relationships are the barbells of the soul. And that all of life is about a soul journey. And it's a journey of learning, of development and growth, and of learning to cherish life and all of life, every bit of it, just exactly the way it is. Those are some of the things that I believe in. So when we attracted those people that are doing to us what our parents did, it's because we've got a lesson to learn. And when we can learn that lesson and heal, we no longer need those people in our lives and we can move on. But if you don't look at it and if you don't own it for yourself, then you leave that one and you go to the next one and and voila, there they are again. And you leave that one, you go to the next one and voila, there they are again. So, All of these are aspects of inner mastery, of understanding what are the deeper dynamics at play inside of me that are producing what I'm experiencing out there. And in fact, the number one question we can ask is, if I'm seeing something out there that's upsetting me or bothering me, what's going on in me that put me in this position where I can choose differently, I can do use a tool or a technique to change what's happening inside of me. So I don't need that out there anymore. Mm, Yeah. Well, and I like what you said to the, um, that relationships are the barbells of the soul because yes, my understanding is that uh, what it is that we need to, to learn or master will keep coming back into our lives, but there's a self-fulfilling prophecy too. When you, when you're attracting that, which needs to be healed, right? When you're attracting that into your life, that it also is that reinforcer where you'll hear people say, oh, all men are the same or all women are, you know, (laughs) they're like, I'm not interested in anybody. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna fall in love with anyone because all they do is hurt me, blah, 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 blah. But (laughs) what I I found is that when you, um, when you deal with what the core issue is, and if that is not feeling loved enough, feeling emotionally ignored if that's what your parent did whatever whatever it is if it's the you know the the rage that someone has expressed upon you mm-hmm. when you really really work on that and deal with that which can take you know it can take a whole lifetime it just depends on the person then you um then you're you're done with that lesson and yes. and then when you when you again go back inside and seek the happiness inside, not on the outside, not seeking it. To, someone's going to fix you. Someone's going to make me happy and 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 kiss all these wounds from my childhood. No, no, no. You go in and you kiss those wounds and you deal yes. with it. Then, beautiful human beings come into your life through friendships or through romantic through relationships. Your soulmates, your your yes. twin hearts. They're able right. to come in because you've healed. They're not going to come in until right. you heal. Yes. Exactly right. The other ones are the are the teachers, you know, and even the people who have treated mm-hmm. in relationships who have maybe not been so kind to me or so wonderful. They have been great teachers because it mm-hmm. brought me back to myself. 
which is, I mean, that's, that's where I think, you're, like you said, all the healing begins with yourself. Exactly. And, and I'm going to build on two things that you said there uh, that uh, are just really gray. And, and the first one you were talking about, we tend, because of the things that happen to us, we develop beliefs. And then we treat those beliefs like they're true instead of something we just made up. And many, many of our beliefs are l- limit, limiting. They diminish what's possible for us and they diminish the quality of our lives. And in some ways, we're almost a victim of them. Uh, we can't escape them. They own us instead of us owning them. So in emotional mastery, I talk about there's four C's that we want to be able to to develop mastery in these areas. And the first is choose, choose your reality. The second is center into peace. It's creating a state of calm, quiet peacefulness, as opposed to stress and anxiety. Clean, which is clean up your drama. And and that's get out of the, the victim stories and the drama that you're creating in your relationships. And the final C is clear, clear out your baggage. But it all begins with choose. It all begins with choosing your reality. And I I started off today saying that everybody is creating their reality. They create it by the thoughts they think. Most people are a victim of those thoughts, meaning those thoughts are happening to them and they think they're true instead of just something that we learned to make sense of life, but that maybe don't serve us anymore. So choosing your reality is the ability to gain awareness of what is my bias, what what is happening inside of me, what thoughts are occurring, and do these thoughts serve me? And if they don't, to use tools to be able to change those thoughts, uh, re- rewrite your brain. Uh, the brain is a computer, and anything that is stored there can be changed. And I know many, many people I've helped that are profoundly different human beings through learning to have a relationship with their thoughts and how do I notice them, evaluate if they're serving me and change them if they're not serving me. And then the second thing I wanna build on is what you said, you know, we, we look for other people, we look for the knight in shining armor, armor, whoever or whatever that is, that's gonna make me feel better and be, be the person that makes me feel loved and worthwhile. And you might remember that movie, Jerry Maguire, one of the worst uh, an unhealthy relationship lines in history was you complete me. Right, you, right. <laughs> if you're saying that, you're setting yourself up for heartbreak because you're expecting that person out there to fix what's wounded inside of you. And that's a terrible burden. And it's it's not their responsibility to fix you. It's not their responsibility to make you happy. It's their responsibility to be who they are. So the the comment you made is we have to console ourselves. And in this, in the book, Dear Human, Master Your Emotions, there's a whole section on how do you choose your reality? How do you learn to be aware of your thoughts? How do you learn to change your thoughts? And there's specific tools about consoling yourself. How, how If you're really upset and can't let go of a hurt or can't let go of an upset and you're just dwelling, dwelling, how do you turn within and have a relationship with the part of your mind that has got that hurt so that you are the one that consoles and loves and and provides loving acceptance to yourself and heals that, heals that experience. And there's tools, fast, easy tools to do that. I mean, literally easily within five minutes and and many of these tools work within one minute of, of starting to use them. That's what I love about the work that you do is that you give people you know, actual tools in order to begin the process of having a relationship with their thoughts. Most people don't even, don't even consider that we react, we react, yes. something happens, we react, something happens in the news. It's not just a relationship when, when yes. it, it, something right. will happen in the news and, and, and boom, you see Facebook, Twitter, everybody's tweeting and, and expressing themselves. And that's, and that's all, you know, well and good. But what happens is that it is an action and then a reaction, an action mm-hmm. and a reaction. And it's the same thing that happens in relationships. Um, someone says something 
uh, or 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 does something. And if you take it from a prism, if you if you're looking at the world through hurt eyes, through yes. um, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy of love, I'm not worthy of happiness or uh, fulfillment, then whatever that person does, then it could be skewed as an assault on you, um, uh, mm-hmm. disrespectful, yes. hurting, right. all of those mm-hmm. things. Because it's we're looking through, it's almost like putting on sunglasses, right? Yes. And with those yes. sunglasses, everything you see is an attack on you or or a way of minimizing you or hurting you because in your head those grooves of i'm not worthy everyone hurts me this one's going to hurt me too those grooves of thought are really ingrained but Mm -hmm. as you know um through the work that you've done with inner mastery that those grooves they can be overridden but we need to know that they are we need to know that they're grooves and the beautiful thing is is that when you have a relationship with your thoughts that's when you can change it. Um, yes. I've just recently, and because I am in a, in a beautiful relationship, beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous relationship with the most amazing human being, and we, we, um, we, we help each other when we have those triggers, when we have those trigger thoughts, when we have those moments where we start to slide down. We're going to get back to, I want to get to a, something that you talk about that's brilliant, the penthouse versus like, you know, the attic or whatever. But I mean, the, the, the basement. But yeah. when we start to get, when we get triggered and we start to go down that spiral and you know yeah. when it is, you can feel it. Your, your heartbeat goes up a little bit. You Maybe you start to sweat. Um, icky feeling in your... I call it the icks, the ickies, right? Icky feeling in your mm-hmm. stomach. I've yeah. been able to just recently um, step back from my thoughts and I look at them and, I'm, and, I've, and I can say this because it's a podcast, but I've, I've gone to the point where I've said, I said, oh, fuck you. No, you go. You, that's not right. You know that's not true. Get the I, and I I yell at it. I, I say I say get the fuck out of my head. No. <laughs> and so instead of reacting, because you want to react, you want to go, you want to yeah. say something hurtful back, yeah. or you know, yeah. nah, nah. What I do is I step back, and yeah. I tell it that thought that's not true, and yeah. then I say, let's see how this person treats me. Mm-hmm. Because you're assuming something bad, but let's see how this human interacts with me and expresses themselves and every single time there's nothing to I, I, there's nothing to worry about it was just a, a silly trigger from an old wound brilliant spot on and i talk about a pilot and autopilot and the pilot is our conscious awareness when when everything's going great we we're our best selves if there's no stressors nothing upsetting us we're really pretty awesome but when we get triggered, <laughs> we're, we, we're pretty we awesome. Take, yes. Yeah. If you think about our consciousness as a skyscraper, and as we grow and develop our consciousness, we add new floors, which is new where awarenesses, new uh, abilities of self mastery, the capacity to love, be wise, treat people well. You know, all of that. That our best self lives in the penthouse, and when we get triggered, we take the elevator down. And as we move down, it's like we're devolving. We're going backwards in time. And, and the more triggered we are, the further down we go. And, and the more basic our reactions are. So we have old thoughts. We have old emotions and, and old behaviors that we, that we used to do. And, and our goal is to be able to, it's not that we're not going to get triggered. Even I, I mean, as much as work as I've done, I still get triggered. It's about what you were talking about, catching yourself, stopping the drop down and restoring yourself back to the penthouse. And, and I have a, a, a couple of chapters in the book where a specific tool called Max the Moment, where I talk about that. And there's a three step process where you you tame it, you name it and you reframe it. And taming it is recognizing, hey, I'm I'm going into reaction here. And stopping, breathing, I've got a, tech, a tool called Drain the Pain um, that I'll say a little more about later because you can download it for free. Um, uh, I'll give you the website where you can get that chapter for free. Wonderful. Where you restore yourself 
to a little bit <clears throat> of control uh, of, I should say not control, but uh, you're, you've restored yourself to a higher level of functioning just by draining that emotional charge. And then you can realistically name what's this drama. Like when you said, I look within and I see a story I have and I go, but wait a minute, that's not true. And I don't, I don't want to act like that was true. I want to act in a way that's going to produce the most loving outcome I can produce here that gets my needs met, but also my partner's needs met. Well, that's the naming. Like what, what is the story I'm in? In what way is this person a villain? What's the emotions I'm experiencing? And what's, what's my real need in this situation? And then you move to the reframe and that is, well, what's my outcome? And not, not just how do I get my needs met in a selfish way? It's how do we get our needs met? How, how do, in this circumstance, how does everyone uh, get, get what they need out of the circumstance? And by thinking about it differently, like they're not, they're not being a bully. They're just doing their best to get their needs met. So if I get out of that bully story and I just engage them from compassion and go, so what is it you what is it you are looking to get? And here's what I need to get. That's the reframe part. But there's there's I have an invitation for you if you're interested in hearing it. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that is that when it, it, let me just set the stage for what I'm about to say. Our autopilot isn't one thing. Our autopilot is thousands of programmed responses that we programmed while we were growing up, most of which were programmed before we were 10 years old. And how do we take care of ourselves? How do we interpret the world and how do we respond to it so we can be safe and get our needs met? And everything we have programmed in our subconscious, our autopilot isn't the bad guy. Our autopilot thinks it's the superhero. It thinks it's rushing to your rescue to save you and it shoves you out of the way. Like when we go into an emotional reaction, it shoves you out of the driver's seat. It shoves the pilot out, jumps in and takes charge. And we don't think about that process. If, if you get triggered, you don't stop and go, huh, am I going to be <laughs> angry about this? Frustrated, <laughs> resentful, a, a sad hurt. What's it going to be? No, boom, we're there. It's taken over. But it's not taking over because it's bad. It's taking over because it's trying to save the day. And, and you got to remember, these are hurt parts of us. They're the, for you, it's little Christine. And it may be Christine at four years old. It may be Christine at 14 years old. Right. That is applying a strategy that worked at 14 or four that doesn't work now. So instead of being angry, which just makes that part of you feel even more rejected, what I encourage you to do is to turn toward it with love and compassion and say, thank you for trying to help me. What you're trying to do is to help me get this need met, but I've got a different way to do it. And, and I'm going to turn to a different part of me and use that part. And, and so your job is done. You can go away. That's a form of self-soothing, but it's also self-love. Mm, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Is that landing with you? Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's what most of us do. Most of us do to our inner life what other people are doing to us in the outer life. So if we get attacked by someone and we don't like the response, we turn around and attack ourselves. If someone's unloving toward us, we turn within and we're unloving toward ourselves by blaming ourselves for not being good enough to deserve their love. Oh, yeah. And, yes. And so we turn it around and say, I'm going to love and accept every aspect of myself. Piece by piece by piece, I'm going to reclaim the things that I'm judging and and um, and and trying to disown and love them back into myself. Not only will I no longer react out there in the world, but I will be able to love other people who are behaving in those ways that I used to reject about myself. Well, you you did you nailed it on the head there with the. F the fact that we are our own worst enemy in many respects. And once we get triggered and do that spiral down from the penthouse and we spiraling yes. down, right? What I've noticed too, is that in addition to spiraling down and like 
throwing out everything, you know, you know, every uh, or pulling up the emotion from every past hurt, kind of what they call kitchen sinking it. Right. Whenever (laughs) whenever we get too emotionally triggered. But then there is that moment where you're mad at yourself for getting upset. So there's a shame in the fact that you lost your shit, you know, that you lost your that you lost your temper or that you right. reacted. Exactly. So then mm-hmm. it's another dumping on. Then you, then you're yes. dumping. <laughs> and and that's the nature of of you know, it's brain chemistry, Christine, and and it's important to understand our brains. Actually fascinatingly, I've went and visited a a school called the Momentous Institute in South Dallas in it. It's an elementary school from pre-K to fifth grade for the um, low-income people in that area. But it's a very different school in the sense that it teaches emotional intelligence to three-year-olds and it teaches it through the whole through the whole school curriculum. So when three-year-olds come in, the first things they learn are how to name the parts of the brain. And most of my executive clients can't do that. But that's in fact what we're doing when we talk about having mastery is that we're we're changing which parts of our brain are in charge because the pilot lives in your forehead it's called the prefrontal cortex and these <laughs> four-year-olds are, are literally talking about i i'm i'm working hard to get back into my prefrontal cortex <laughs> you know, it's, oh my god <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> and they teach them about the midbrain which is as it sounds it's in the middle of the brain and it's mostly regulated by the amygdala, which is your fear center. And and so when we get triggered, whether it's stress or whether it's an emotional reaction to a specific event, and, and stress is an emotional reaction to a wide range of, of events, but there's still emotional reactions, our brain functioning moves from the pilot in the prefrontal cortex to the midbrain where the, pre, where the amygdala is. And, and it's a bunker mentality. It's a fear-based mentality where I start to be paranoid and I start to be really selfish in my thinking. We lose 10 to 15 IQ points when we're emotionally triggered. Oh, and say this again. Consider, Wait, say that again, Mark. You have to say that again. You lose 10 to 15 IQ points. And when you consider that the average IQ is 100 and the range is generally from 90 to 110 for average, and most people are average, Losing that many points drops you to below average. Your 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 um, diminished functioning is dramatic. You you don't process information as well because you're in those stories, as you said. You put these glasses on and they get thicker, and you start to see more and more of the very thing that's upsetting you, and and you lose the ability to see. But wait a minute, there's another interpretation here, where uh, maybe I don't need to get upset about this. And uh, our decision making is strongly uh, thwarted. And, and I work with executives and a lot of them go, but I'm not emotional. And, and they say, you know, you ask anybody, they'll tell you that I don't ever get upset in meetings. And I said, those are two different things. What you show people is control. What's happening inside you is the emotional reaction. And I promise you, you're having an emotional reaction. So your brain is changing. And, and the interesting thing is, is we're not aware that we've got diminished cognitive functioning. Our brain isn't working as well. We don't notice it because we're in that brain. So maybe you've known people who were so drunk that it was clear they could not drive, that they they were a threat to everybody, including themselves, but they were convinced they could drive. Or maybe you've been that person. I know I've been that person before. Have you had that experience, Christina, knowing someone like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Yeah. Uh, Too many people. Yeah. Yeah, So we have to ask the question, how is it that they can't see how impaired they are? And the reason is, is that they're inside the impairment and they're trying to use that impaired brain to evaluate their impairment. And it can't. The same is true when we're emotionally upset. The brain we're in is the upset brain, and it is diminished in its ability to evaluate our upset. So we have to just know for a fact, if I'm upset, I'm not at my best. <laughs> no, you're, I, yeah. I am not going to do well here, and I can't fake it. 
I can't just not show it and, and pretend that all of a sudden my thinking is better too, because it is not. It's, it's narrower. It's more paranoid. It's more selfish. It's, it's more tactical and local as opposed to strategic and, and bigger picture. And, and all of those lead to poor interactions. Plus, we are so trained to read micro expressions that even if you're not blowing up like a drama king or queen, your face is going to show it. The color is going to drain from your face. Your eyes are going to narrow. Your lips are going to thin. Your, your jaw is going to clench. You're going to cross your arms. You're going to stop breathing. You're going to, your neck and shoulders will be tense. And, and we read that subconsciously. And you're not fooling anybody. Everybody knows what's happening to you. They just don't know why. Because you're not being, you're not revealing. So the reason I'm saying this is that the path to a great life goes through developing a rich and loving and healthy, masterful relationship with your emotions because emotions affect everything that matters in life. They affect your health tremendously. They affect your relationships. They affect your your um, prosperity in the sense that if I have emotional reactions to not having enough money, that's going to lead me to believe into beliefs that cause me to have even less money, or if I'm not uh, in mastering my emotions at work, then I'm not going to have a great career and I'm not going to be very successful. And spirituality, these are the four dimensions, health, relationships, prosperity, and spirituality. And in our emotions are the, the barrier between us being able to connect with something higher than us and to actually live as that higher being. So this, this one thing, learning how to be in relationship with your emotions, to realize they're assets, they're here to help me if I know how to use them, that I can reprogram my autopilot so I don't react, I respond. I can step into a, a reaction and head it off through the max of the moment. I can drain the energy of an emotional charge through drain the pain. And all of these are fast and easy to do. And it gives us the only true power we have in the world. And that is to be our best self and bring that best self to everything we do. Mm. And it's the, the beautiful thing, too, is that you, as you'll see, the, the, more, the, the, the more that you heal yourself or work on, on becoming in touch with those emotions and in, in charge in the driver's seat, so to speak, that it's a ripple effect because it affects everything around you. Energy, like a trend, like energy attract, what energy attracts like energy. So, exactly. so if you're in that mood of like every, you know, in that angry mood of, of being triggered, you're going to attract things that are going to trigger it more, right? That spiral goes deeper and deeper and deeper. That was yes. something that I noticed too with my, with my father when, when, um, if he was, you know, especially if he was drinking and he would get upset over something, then he would get ups He would get angry at that. He was getting angry. <laughs> and then he would say, you see what you did. You made me angry, <laughs> which was not funny, but again. no, but right. But it, it's, it's crazy making it's crazy making. Yes. But what, 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 what it was, was there was an actual physical expression of, someone who has lost control of their emotions. They're not mastering their emotions. And it's, and right. it's right there at like a movie screen right in front of you. So yes. you can see that, oh, this is an example of someone who has not mastered their emotions. Yes. Yes. Now, then you can take it one of two ways again, but you can uh, work on mastering your own emotions because you see it so you know blatant. What, I wanted to know, what, do, what, is your, um, what is your take on the ego? Because ego, it seems to be um, maybe when we get into those emotional states, when we're spiraling down from the penthouse. I don't even know if we're taking the elevator down or if we're just jumping out the window. But, <laughs> but, but what, what about ego? What about the, you know, what is it about that? that well, that's a, well, that's a huge, huge conversation and one of my favorite conversations. Because my life purpose is to help people to raise their consciousness. And, and raising their consciousness is a shift in identity from our personality or our, our ego. And you can think about that as who we've been taught to be versus our soul, which is our true self, and who we actually are 
and who we naturally are. And, and our soul self doesn't have to try to be good because it is good. It's the nature of our soul, of who we are as divine beings, as souls, to be compassionate and loving and understanding and strong and courageous. And all of those uh, wonderful characteristics emanate from our, our soul. And all of the selfish and fearful behaviors are coming from ego. Now, ego is not the bad guy. Ego is not a thing you want to get rid of. You can't because you have to have you have to have that lens to interact with the world. What you want is to heal your ego, to clear out all the things that are making it fearful. Which is, you know, that when we talk about the healing of clean up your drama and clear out your baggage, that level of healing is where you get to the my, my deep patterns where nobody loves me, I don't belong, I'm not competent. And like you said, the, the fear of that led me to recreate it and to interpret things in ways that reinforced that I didn't deserve to be loved until I healed all that. And then I could attract the kind of woman I have as my wife today who's magnificent human being. Uh, we have to, to heal all of those things. And as we do, then the ego becomes more and more transparent and the soul light shines through. We don't have to be more of a soul. We have to be less of what we're not. And we're not all these fears. We're not all these hurts and resentments and pain and addictions. And those are not us. And, and the more we let go of those, the more magnificent life is. And it truly can be joyful and fulfilling every day, no matter what's happening. And, and so what I would say about ego is we want a very healthy relationship with ego. We want to partner with ego and put the soul in charge and have the ego be responsible for what the ego's good at, which is tactical things like doing math and paying bills and constructing a plan and and the sort of things that the brain, which is the home of the ego, is there to do. But how we, what we value and how we make choices in our life, those come from the soul. And when they come from the soul, they're going to be right every time. They're going to be true every time. Mm, yeah. and this is not the kind of normal conversation I have with <laughs> around my book. And yet everything in that book is designed around this concept. I, I do talk about it. And one of the first chapters is power versus force. And in it, I say that anytime we're reacting out of our autopilot, it's fear-based and it's going to be a dominant. It's going to re lead to a forceful reaction that creates damage. And force is always about getting our way at the consequence of someone or something else. And power is it coming from the soul. Power is about asserting for an outcome in the most loving, compassionate way, but also strong so that we get what we need, but we don't get it at somebody else's expense. And, and the more that we're able to stay in the penthouse, the more we're able to tune into our soul and quit identifying with this personality, the more we do things out of power instead of out of dominance and force. I want to live in the penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have very expensive taste. No, <laughs> um, Mark, because uh, we're we've got about ten minutes, maybe ten minutes left. I would love for you, if you could possibly maybe give our listeners some tools, um, some little quick little tools, tips and tricks, maybe uh, for when they do get triggered, when they get triggered into you know. Again, those feelings of, of, of being unloved, unworthy, even though they're, they may not seem that way uh, at the moment when you're triggered, um, mm -hmm. but the, the ego pops in there. From, from your book, Dear Human, Master Your Emotions, if you could give our listeners just a couple of those little uh, tools that are on the top of your head, that would be wonderful. Yes, yes. and you mentioned you know, that I provide a lot of tools, and that was my goal. The, the tools... The, actually, the concepts and tools in this book are the very same ones I use in my executive coaching. These are CEOs and their teams. So it's the very top people in businesses. And this is what I teach them about inner mastery, self-mastery, emotional mastery. And, and they're extremely powerful. And the whole last half of the book are specific tools to address how do you choose your reality? How do you center into peace? How do you clean up your drama? And how do you clear out your baggage? 
Now, there's obviously many, many more tools than that. Um, but in the context of the book, there are really uh, powerful and accessible tools there. And one of the one of the ones that I use every day, I call it an, an emotional hygiene <laughs> technique. You know how you have physical hygiene, you wash your hands, uh, to make sure they're clean when you're going to touch things. Well, uh, emotional hygiene is about keeping your your emotions cl- cleared out so that you're calm and centered and neutral. And w- one of the tools for that I, I call drain the pain. And your your listeners can download that chapter for free. Going to my website, uh, I have a particular URL that points them to my my website and and that is called MasterYourEmotionsBook.com. MasterYourEmotionsBook.com. And if they'll go there, they're going to be able to learn more about the book. They also will be able to uh, download that chapter. And I'm going to talk about the tool right now and what the concept is around the tool. Emotions, Christine, emotions are messengers. We don't think that. We think there's good emotions and bad emotions. And so you might also think pleasant emotions and painful emotions, but, but they aren't, they're just emotions. They're all here. And we're born with this palette of emotions and no user guide. But if we realize when an emotion arises, it's doing two things. It's bringing you information and it's bringing you energy. And the, and the energy is there to help you to be able to follow through on the information. So if we take anger, anger's job is to hold a boundary. And anger shows up when someone crosses a boundary that's important to you. They touch you in a way that's not appropriate. They um, are uh, doing, uh, uh, saying something emotionally abusive that is not okay for you, things like that. And you need to be able to have an energy that's strong enough to meet that challenge and hold your boundary and say, stop, this is not acceptable. Well, what most people do, and the reason anger becomes a problem, is they turn anger into an aggressive tool, that they go beyond the boundary and attack, or they use it to create their own dominating response back toward people. And that's the misuse of emotions. Frustration's job, which in business, so many of my clients, that's the number one emotion is frustration. Most people, when they get frustrated, they blame the thing out there that's frustrating them. My kid won't, keeps dropping their clothes in the middle of the floor, and I've told them a hundred times. Or my employee, I told them how to do this five times, and they're still not getting it right. They get angry out there. But frustration's job is to tell you, hey, wait a second here. What you're doing isn't working. You tried that. Don't try it again. Try something else, which is turning it inward. It's telling you turn within and own the fact that you're actually not being effective here and quit trying to do it the way you've been doing it and find another way. Don't blame the world out there. And here's some energy that will help you to do that. So drain the pain is based on the idea that we go into a drama story, which is you made me wrong. You know, you done me wrong type of story. If there's a villain in your story, you're in drama. So whether it's the traffic whether it's a storm that's ruining your picnic, whether it's your children, wherever it's coming from, when something in your world is upsetting you, that thing is a villain to you. It's, it's the persecutor that's making you be thwarted or feel bad or feel hurt in some way. And, and you're, when you're in a drama story, you lose all your power and you turn toward force. And one of the things that keeps you hooked into drama is the emotional charge. Oh, boom. Bingo. Because because it's an energy. And as long as that energy is there, it's very difficult to climb, to, to punch the button, to go back up to the penthouse. But if you can drain that energy, like pop the bubble, so to speak, and, and the emotional charge isn't there, you're, it's like your mind immediately clears and you start to go, wait a minute. It's, it's not that big a deal, and it makes it much easier to use other tools like Max the Moment or console yourself to truly transform yourself and get all the way back to the penthouse of your consciousness. 
So the way during the pain works is emotions are chemicals. They're in your body. You'll feel them. You'll feel them in your body. Christine, you may feel it in your heart. You may feel it in your shoulders, sometimes in our head and our throat. We may feel a clenching in our gut. When we're upset, we feel it somewhere in our body. Do you know what I'm referring to? Yep. <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> okay. So, so with neuro-linguistic programming, visualization is the language of the autopilot. It's the language of the subconscious. So we're going to visualize a container in the place where we feel that emotion. And, and to start with, let's just make it a, 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 like a cylinder, like a, a big drum of some kind, a, a storage container. with, And the storage container is under pressure. The water in there, inside of it, represents this energy. And it's, it wants out, but it's stuck. And, and so it's under pressure. And imagine a faucet at the bottom of that cylinder, of that container. And you would imagine opening it, turning the water on. And it's also got a little gauge on the side, a glass gauge, so you can see it emptying. And as you hear the water, you see the water, you feel the water emptying out through you down into the ground. You see the gauge, the water in the gauge dropping, dropping, dropping engage all three senses richly and vividly, you'll also feel yourself becoming lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter as the weight lifts and the weight of that emotion grounds out of you and until it's completely empty and you look at the gauge and it's completely empty and then you can dissolve the container because you don't need it anymore. And that can happen literally within one minute. And as soon as you've done that, your head clears. And you have so much more choice now than you did when you were gripped by that emotion. So that's one tool, one fast tool. A lot of people who do impulsive eating, it's because there's an emotion they're not looking at. And the emotion and the eating is a way to soothe themselves. But instead of going to grab that candy bar or whatever it is that you're going to eat that is not good for you, a big bag of chips or whatever it is, instead of doing that, if you will turn within and go, what's the emotion I'm ignoring here? What have I got, what am I holding back? And is there just one or there more than one? And drain them, as soon as that emotion's gone, the hunger's gone because you don't need to soothe anything anymore. Mm. That That is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And And there's so many that are in your book Mark Youngblood, author of Dear Human, Master Your Emotions. I want to give out the website again. And you had mentioned, too, that people have, there's a free download. Uh, yes. There's a chapter that they can actually download to help them and to get them started on this. It, it's a beautiful path because once you do clear out those old wounds, those old stories that we tell ourselves over and over and over again, then I, I invite people to do this because then they can actually begin to really, truly live and love uh, their children, their parents, uh, you know, um, significant others that come into their lives. They can actually really have a beautiful, beautiful experience. So it's masteryouremotionsbook.com. And also people can purchase the book on Amazon as well, but get more information and, and get that uh, chapter if you can at masteryouremotionsbook.com. Mark Youngblood, thank you so very much for being with us this hour. And I would love to have you come back. Would you be Would you be willing to come back and do another show? You bet, Christine. This has been one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had um, in doing these interviews. Uh, it, you're a real delight. Thank you very much for today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I want to thank our listeners for listening uh, this week. Don't forget that you can subscribe to this program by uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel. Also, you can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode by uh, downloading the podcast app uh, from iTunes or iHeartRadio. Just look for Out of the Box Radio with Christine. Until next week, I want to remind you to always, always think outside of the box. Bye for now.